today. Um, so I have a fairly informal talk for you today. I could be quite formal, but I've gotten tired of my formality. So I just thought from scratch this morning what I might say to you in terms of giving you a sense of both what we're doing at the University of Virginia, but focusing on the issue of what is contemplation. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of a personal context for why I spend much of my day these days thinking about what is contemplation. Uh, like this morning, I was just writing to my partner. I just sent her a bunch of weird text messages about what is contemplation. Just because I was driving the car, I needed some way to transcribe my thoughts so I could bring them back here to you today. So my, my background is in Buddhist meditation. It's what I did for my PhD in, so I've done my academic work in and so forth. So I actually professionally have focused on something called Buddhist meditation or Buddhist contemplation for all of my adult life. But the last couple of years here at the University of Virginia, we started this contemplative sciences initiative to explore whatever contemplation might be over the last three years in different walks of life, in undergraduate experience, in the business school, the healthcare, K through 12 education, and so forth. And so one of the problems I confronted immediately was I didn't really understand what contemplation was. Now, I've been doing it all my life. I knew what Buddhist meditation was. But this way that everybody was talking about mindfulness and contemplation and so forth, it was completely unclear to me what they meant by it. And since I had to now become the spokesperson for all of this, it became clear to me that I wasn't quite sure what I meant by it. And so for the last three years, I've just repeatedly come back to this question of what is contemplation, with a particular focus on it in an educational context. K through 12 education, we've been doing a lot of work in, and then of course also higher education, undergraduates, their student experience, and then the way in which it gets manifested in the various professional schools and graduate programs, business, health sciences, and so forth. And also recently I've been preparing to do a, a big massive open online course in June, which has like 110,000 people subscribed to it. And I felt a lot of stress about that because then I have to define contemplation for so many people, it could be really quite embarrassing very quickly. So every day these days I wake up, really I almost dream of these things about what is contemplation. So I've got about, um, I think, nine points here I just want to step through and give you a sense of how I'm thinking about contemplation and hopefully it's a little bit helpful for you in terms of thinking about what is contemplation and all its various kind of sub-formations, whether meditation or mindfulness and yoga and so forth. But I'm going to stick with contemplation. That's my favorite word these days. I like it much better than mindfulness and uh, meditation and so forth. So I start with what uh, American psychologist William James said many years ago, varieties of religious experience, which for me means different forms of Buddhist meditation. They are very, very different from each other. There are a thousand and one different forms of Buddhist meditation, and it's very unclear how they're connected to each other or how you would use them or why they're like this and how to understand all that diversity. You have things that are very simple, quiet sitting. You have complex postures. You have really complex visualizations you do. You have things that involve dreaming at night and sexuality or um, manipulating energies within your body. I mean, it's really, really diverse. So one kind of subtext here is just, how do they all connect together? How do they all relate to each other? How does this cohere? It's something that Buddhists have been struggling with for 2,500 years and they haven't figured it out yet. So if you're confused, it's okay. It's, there's a long history to it. The second thing that I was trying to figure out is what does it mean when we take a word like contemplative and we stick it on something as an adjective? So you suddenly hear, same thing with mindfulness, you know, like contemplative parenting, or contemplative walking, or contemplative thinking, or contemplative art, or mindful mayonnaise. That's, that's really a product, <laughs> mindful mayonnaise. And I think that one's probably made by elves in the North Pole who are very careful when they make the mayonnaise. So, so these words mindfulness and contemplative now we see everywhere. We see entire books devoted to some process that has that adjective attached to it. And while that's certainly a kind of contemporary phenomenon, this idea of just taking contemplative as an adjective and putting it on an ordinary activity and suddenly you have two forms of activity. You have walking, you have contemplative walking. It's actually not a new phenomenon. It's new in the scale and the nature and the way it's bound up with the advertising industry. But there's a very old history to this notion of taking something like contemplative and saying a very ordinary activity becomes extraordinary. And how does that happen? And so in the history of Buddhist contemplation, we have walking, very well-known form of meditation, where they 
make it a contemplative process. But also they take dreaming, and there's very detailed meditations for how you dream contemplatively. And sexuality, very famous in Tibetan Buddhism, there's contemplative sexuality. So they don't have contemplative parroting in Tibet, absolutely not. They just beat the kid, not to <laughs> They have older traditional attitudes towards parenting. Um, so they don't have it applied in that ubiquitous way, but they certainly have some very core human processes we're familiar with that they think of as meditation. Another thing that I have been thinking a lot about is secularization, uh, namely, what happens when you take something from a religious context, Buddhist or Hindu or Christian or Islamic or Native American or whatever it might be, and move that into a non-religious context? That's a very, very complex process, and there's a lot of things to think about that, so I can't get into that because I'll run on my little 10-minute time. So, against that background, you have some kind of sense of what goes on in here most days. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how I've been thinking about how to puzzle through what <clears throat> contemplative means as an adjective, what contemplation means as a noun, and how we can make sense of the diversity of all these things, and always thinking about how to bring it back to an educational context. And we're currently, with the Curry School of Education, embarked in one of the largest studies ever done in Louisville, Kentucky, to take these kinds of practices and bring them into a K-12 environment with uh, 20,000 kids, with Patrick Pollan of Youthnex and Tish Jennings of Curry and so forth, as well as the work we're doing here at the um, kind of undergraduates and the various graduate schools and so forth. So that's the kind of background. So, how am I doing? So, like five minutes? Yeah. Okay. So I have five minutes to explain to you the sum total of my last three years. Of my <laughs> so, so one thing I keep coming back to over and over again is the question of practice. Practice is something that we're all very familiar with. I mean, when I grew up, it was practice the cello, because I was part of a youth symphony. I had absolutely no ability, but my uncle was a very famous violinist for the Chicago Symphony, so they kept waiting, but it never happened. <laughs> Manifestation of talent. But I did practice. So practices. We're, practices are ubiquitous, obviously. We're all engaged in practices of many kinds throughout our life. Many have been unconsciously imbibed from childhood, linguistic practices, emotional, physical, social, and so forth. And others like cello are things that we self-consciously make a decision to acquire. And there are, of course, some processes in our body, the like unfolding of our genes and so forth, but practices are absolutely ubiquitous in our lives. And many of them we don't recognize. Many we think are just processes. They're natural. They're the way the world is, the way the body is. And then we go to another culture and suddenly we're like, what's wrong with you people? Why can't you be natural? Because then suddenly we recognize that those are practices, things that we thought were natural, things that we thought were processes. And the other thing about practices is their plasticity, their malleability, their capacity to change. There's so much research in different domains of the academy these days that's showing things that we thought were fairly non-changeable, fairly rigid in structure, in structure, at least by the time we became adults, it's turning out have this plasticity to them, this malleability, this capacity for us to participate, to interact with our brain structure, our health, our well-being, our emotions, our personality orientation, and so forth. Of course, there's, there's limits, but that plasticity is something that's very much on um, many people's the tip of their tongue. It has to do with the practices and the processes, and what can we do then? How can we work with that plasticity? How can we offer training programs in a first grade environment or in a professional development workshop or in our own lives? Training where we can take advantage of that plasticity and begin to understand the practices we're engaged in and go through a process of transformation or change. So, uh, two ways I've been thinking about that in, in terms of that possibility of plasticity with regards to our practices. One is self-awareness or reflexive awareness or the capacity to bring our awareness in a disciplined way to these practices, to these processes, to turn our awareness into receptive awareness, turn it in our body, cultivate an understanding of our body in our own personal awareness. Or mindfulness, very classical definition of mindfulness is to watch our emotions, watch our thoughts, watch how we react to other people. We can also turn our awareness to other people. We can turn our awareness to our breath. We can turn our awareness to so many things in our experience. And the funny thing about our own self-awareness, as opposed to studying things externally, when we study things in this way, when we bring our own awareness to processes and practices that constitute our life, they can be changed. 
In fact, there's an inherent change that happens when you bring your awareness. It's the reason why when you're furious, if you suddenly become aware you're furious, it's a little bit harder to keep furious, right? Because you're aware. The awareness is not, I can bring my awareness to that camera and unfortunately nothing changes. I could bring my awareness to Lindsay, but she's an animate being, so she's got, she's actually changed already. But um, I can't will her to do that. I can't will the inanimate to do that. But when I bring my awareness to my breathing, or to my muscles, or to my emotions, or to my thoughts, or to how I relate to another person, or how I listen to another person, or how I talk, or how I speak, these things change, and they can change. And so, contemplative practice is trying to work that domain, that space, that space between the practices we engage in and our awareness of them. Another way I think about this is modes of awareness. That when we begin to turn our awareness to our awareness, and the way it's bound up with objects of different kinds, we begin to understand that awareness is not a kind of neutral thing. It has many different modalities to it. There's the awareness that focuses on noticing things. There's the awareness that's analytical in character. There's an awareness that's aesthetic in character. We bring it to bear to an artwork or a musical performance. There's an awareness that's interpretive. There's narrative. There's all sorts of forms awareness takes as we use it for different purposes and direct it to different kinds of objects. And this is a big topic in Buddhist meditation, which is the <coughs> objects of meditation. That meditating on different things requires different kinds of awareness. And depending upon what our agenda is and what form of awareness we try to elicit, it has a different impact. And then uh, to get to my things, I only have a couple of minutes left, I think. This is all about the mind. Now that doesn't mean it's only about watching your thoughts. That's a very classic uh, Buddhist bias, which is not a, a good thing, which is all med contemplation is kind of mental in character, using the mind, directing the mind, and so forth. But a broader way to interpret the Buddhist emphasis on mind is that whether it's your body, whether it's your emotions, whether it's your social relationships, the common ingredient in all of this is different forms of awareness. Now, in the Buddhist context, awareness doesn't have to be self-conscious. Many modes of awareness operate below the level of consciousness. So the issue here in Buddhist meditation is it might involve the body, might involve postures or breathing or visualizations, but it always involves awareness at one level or another. The training of awareness, the understanding of different forms of awareness, and ultimately the transformation of awareness. So the big question then is, how do you train? How do you train in awareness? What are the ways that we could take these modes of awareness of, of training and bring them into a broader variety of contexts. So, for example, think about first-year students at the University of Virginia. What practices do we give them to engage in? How do we help them understand their awareness and its possibilities in different kinds of forms? And are we adequately doing that within our classroom environments, much less in our advising or residential programming? I think the ob obvious answer is, is absolutely not. There's lots of room for us to grow and to expand in these spaces. So part of the issue of training, I'll just make two brief mentions, is the formality of it. Uh, Buddhist meditation is all about formality in many ways. And there's also issues of spontaneity and so forth. But there's a formality that says, now I'm meditating. And so when you think about contemplative reading, I have two daughters, and I know how they read. I know how they do everything. <laughs> With a few exceptions, it's multitasking, it's fisher, it's fragmented. They sit on the couch, now I'm reading, now I'm reading my text message, now I'm fighting with my other sister, now I'm doing this, and the TV's on over there. There's no formality to it. So if we were to think about contemplative reading, we might begin by saying, now I read. Now I devote my attention to it. Now I bring my whole being to it. And there's a moment where we stop as well. And so Buddhist meditation talks about a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the beginning usually asks questions about why am I doing this? Why have I come here? What are my goals? What are my intentions? And then there's an actual practice you do where you completely devote your attention, unless you get distracted, which you will, onto that practice. And then at the end, you say, now I conclude. And when I conclude, I consider, I review what experiences did I have. I think about how would I like to carry those experiences into my life. And then I think about why I did that practice and how I hope to benefit myself or others and so forth. There's a formality to it. In terms of the techniques, the components, it's breath, it's posture, it's visualization, it's analysis, it's awareness. It's all these different things that we have, all these practices and processes and capacities 
in our body, in our emotions, in our mind, and so forth, our speech, those are the things that we have to bring to bear, the sounds that we can make. Probably one of the most uh, important contemplative traditions across Asia has to do with sound, simple recitation. Could just be a single sound, om, 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 om. Could be a longer one, like punjo sumno deje zawazum zawun di le rajin da no rajin di. Just a repetition of sound, working with sound, and working with our capacities to make sound and hear sound. So, finally, in conclusion, the context, the very big one, and that goes back to the issue of secular contemplation or the mindfulness revolution in the Buddhist context. In the Buddhist context, meditation is not for dealing with personal problems. It's not after some crisis emerged and so forth. It's also not to smooth out your romantic relationships or improve your parenting and so on, but rather it's more about these general human problems. That's the context of Buddhist meditation. Problems of suffering, of exploitation, of desire, attachment, a need for understanding. That's what we call in religious studies soteriology, salvation. That's the context of Buddhist meditation, always in the end. Now, in fact, if you look at how Buddhist meditation is used on the ground, sometimes they use it for very practical purposes, like finding a lost keychain. <laughs> That's totally true. <laughs> or you're you know, in a retreat and your, your, uh, your knees start to hurt. So there is, in fact, if you really get away from the normative explanations, there are ways in which Buddhist meditation get used for more practical purposes. But there's really nothing like what's happening in American culture right now in terms of the marketing and mindfulness and meditation, where my meditation is for improving your job productivity, improving your sex life, improving your parenting, improving your relationship. That's a pretty big change from a traditional religious context. So, that's the end. I think I ran over my time limit, I'm sorry. But I will say that uh, if you're interested in the Contemplative Sciences Center and what we're doing, there's a sign up form out there. Just put your name down and email address and we can sign you up to the newsletter and you'll start to hear about things as they unfold. So, thank you so much.